Right, hi everyone. Um, thank you for being here and thank you for coming to this great event. I'm having such a good time. Uh, my name is Vasilis. If you want to pronounce my last name, take the K's out. It's just Gogidis. Uh, I'm going to present to you the inverted storytelling pyramid framework, which I made. A little bit about myself. Uh, I work at the University of Southampton at the business school as a doctoral researcher. I'm doing my PhD there. Uh, I work on management education and my research uses games uh, as a sort of like vehicle to get data from the students. And I just published a book called Designing Games and Gamification for Learning. And the framework I'm gonna to present today is part of this book. Uh, I used to work for and with Peter Jenkins, the organizer of this conference. So thank you, Pete, for the invitation. Um, yeah, I think the book has some ideas in it that uh, can apply to different industries and different projects. So it's not just about learning. And hopefully what I'm going to talk about today is going to apply to some of your projects. And actually recently one of my colleagues used it to gamify a product. So here we go. Uh, where did the inspiration for this come? Uh, it came from a video on YouTube. So I don't know if you know this channel, it's called Extra Credits and they have a lot of things around games and gameplay. Uh, but they also have a lot of things around storytelling and stories and literature. And one of the things they have is about Tolkien and Frank Herbert uh, called the world builders. So it analyzes sort of like the way they build engaging storytelling, they build engaging worlds, but they move on their own and they have really interesting stories happening in them. So from that inspiration, I came up with a pyramid idea. And the aim of that was for me to adapt, how can we bring this into games? How can we bring this idea of world building into games, right? Um, so the aim of my framework is to assist everyone to add engaging stories to your games, right? And this is the framework. So it has sort of like these three layers, right? Um, and the bottom layer being the theme, the second layer is the story, and the third layer is world building. And I'm gonna briefly analyze each of them and sort of give you a quick example. Uh, how does this look on its level? So the first, uh, the bottom layer is the theme, right? Uh, this is the setting and the premise of your game. Uh, your game can be based, you know, in a city, in a jungle, on an island. We listened about the archipelago game. Uh, and what is the premise? For example, it can be some conflict, you know, it can be something else. So for example, in Lord of the Rings, spoilers ahead, if you know nothing about Lord of the Rings 2020, you should know something about it. At least watch the movies. Um, the main theme of Lord of the Rings is what is this struggle between good and evil. You have the good side of the, the characters. You have characters fighting for good of the land of Middle Earth, and then you have the evil side. So there is this struggle between the two of them. And the setting is sort of a medieval fantasy setting where you have castles and swords and knights and all of that, but you also have magic. Um, and magical creatures and all of that. So that's the simple setting, the theme, if you're going to say, around Lord of the Rings. Um, going up to the second middle layer, we have the story. So these are the details, we could say. These are the events, the characters, the timeline, what happens specifically in your story. So the setting is sort of the, the, is broad, the theme is broad, right? And then you go in and you have the more specific elements of your story. And again, as an example, um, in Lord of the Rings, this is a super, <laughs> super simplified timeline, obviously. Um, but you have this, let's say, five points. You have Gandalf realizing the danger coming from Mordor. Then what happens? A fellowship is formed, right? And they go into this adventure. The fellowship breaks apart, and you have different parts. Then, in during these different parts of the adventure, the heroes grow, you know, and they learn and they face different enemies and they get ready for the final battle. Uh, it's on their own way, of course. And finally, you have 
this final big battle, right? Which uh, the good guys win and they go on and they rebuild the world uh, in the end of the books and movies and they try to sort of like put it all back together, right? So starting from the theme, these are more specifics of your story in your game. For example, um, these are the who, what, when sort of thing. And the final element of that, the top, top layer, which is the most complex, we could say, and has to do with world building. These are historical backgrounds, geography, economy, cultural backgrounds, religious backgrounds of the people living and breathing there. So if you go back, yes, you have these people, right? You have these events, you have these characters, you have Gandalf and you have the good and the bad guys, but why, what are their motivations? What do they want out of it? What did they do before it? You know, what are they going to do after your story, for example? This can be all of these backgrounds. And of course, um, when we think about Tolkien and Lord of the Rings and what he did, in these books, um, he created the whole language, right? He went in and spent the time to create this world that would move in your head without him moving it, basically. Uh, he created a whole language. He created the whole history for Middle Earth, right? We have the other books that talk about the history of Middle Earth before the movies and all of that. He created names and places and characters that make sense and they live and they move in these worlds. He also created a map, right? You have these maps of Middle Earth and the places around Middle Earth where it's are uh, very detailed and they also have like their own history. Even if some of our characters never visit these places, right? Um, some of them never go to all of the places on the map, but the places on the map are there. So this um, world building stage is quite meticulous. It has a lot of detail that goes into it to sort of build this complicated story and this complicated world. Now, if we bring all of this together, what happens? How can we use this pyramid at the end of the day, right? How is this useful? Sorry. Um, so my suggestion would be to go from bottom to top. And like the arrow in the text on the left says, every layer going up will add some complexity to your storytelling. So if you just have a theme, right? And you have a simple theme, perhaps you're making a game for kids. Perhaps as Will was saying this morning during his, the first talk of the day, I want people to play while they're waiting for the food. You know, I don't want people to be playing during the whole meal. You know, I want someone to engage with my game for like two minutes, okay? And that means I'm not gonna have a lot of story elements. I'm gonna have a little bit of some setting, of some premise, and that's all I need, right? If I wanna add the layer, then I go to the story and I add the events and the characters and the timeline. And again, depending on how long your game is, you know, you might have just that, just a theme, just a story with your characters and your events, and you don't have all of these details, for example, that Tolkien and Herbert have in Lord of the Rings and Dune. Uh, there are plenty of games that have a lot of storytelling and a lot of world building. I'm sure um, most of you know of games such as The Witcher, etc. Um, but, you know, some of you might engage with uh, projects that run for a long time. You know, I remember Andre's presentation today, and at some point he mentioned that if you have to engage with people for a long time, you have to update the content. You know, you have to create new content to engage with them. So when you update this content, maybe you can start building some of these backgrounds. Maybe you can start building some of these stories, right? Little by little, you can add some of these layers. And again, uh, I have another slide about this, but you don't need to have all of these layers to have a good engaging game. Um, a little bit around imaginary worlds versus real settings, which I found fascinating as an idea, really, because you can have a lot of games and a lot of storytelling either in an imaginary world, like Lord of the Rings, 
which of course will have some real world elements. You know, you have horses, you have knights, you have castles. These are inspired by medieval Europe uh, and his specific historical period. Uh, but everything else is, you know, imaginary. All of the characters are imaginary and all of the stories of the characters are imaginary. Or you can place your game in a real world setting, which is also interesting. Like uh, this screenshot I got is from Assassin's Odyssey, Assassin's Creed Odyssey, uh, which was uh, placed in ancient Greece. And I want to make a point here of when you decide where to place your game. Maybe if you have a quick game, if you have a simple game that you want to take out into the world, a real world setting helps you in a way because you don't need to build that background so people know how the place would feel. They know some things about this place and your setting, ancient Greece, you know, medieval Europe, etc. Whatever it might be, a park, a city, an island, you know, um, under the sea. I don't know what sort of theme you pick uh, for your games, but people will have some reference when it's a real world setting. Now, there is a challenge with real world settings, and that's a challenge that this game, uh, Assassin's Creed Odyssey, was really good. And challenge that, um, and, and, and was really good at the challenge. Uh, you have to do some research. So if you place your game in a real world place, it has to be sort of accurate, as accurate as possible, right? Because people will say, mm, I'm not sure that's how things happen. In an imaginary world, you have to do more work and sort of create these places and the people, uh, but people don't necessarily have a reference about it. So it's up to you to decide what's best for you. There are different challenges in both. Um, one last point that I already sort of touched upon. Do I need to do all that to create a good story, to create a good product? Um, because I think... I mentioned at the beginning of my talk that some colleagues have already used some of these ideas to build gamified products. And the answer is not necessarily. You don't need to go through all of these three stages to have an engaging story in a good game. Look at Super Mario, right? Uh, he's doing very well and he doesn't have a complex story. Super Mario almost doesn't have any storytelling elements. It's just a setting. You have to save the princess. And if you take specific Super Mario games as an example, like Super Mario Kart, it has no story, basically. It has this theme, this world, these characters, and that's all. But that fits the game really well. You don't want to get a lot of story for Super Mario. So the final point I want to make is that the complexity needs to fit with what you're making. I already mentioned um, games for kids and... Um, it needs to fit what you're making. This is my last highlight. Toby, I can hear you there. Um, so thank you very much for being part of this. I want to say something I forgot to say at the beginning. The question with the most votes will get one free ebook from me. So if you have the most votes, please send me a text and I'll send you my book. Thank you. Thanks so much, Vasilis. Well, I, I just wanted to to get because we've got absolute ton load of questions, there are lots of questions. So people are very engaged. No so I'm going to ask you. The top one is Norhan Zaran. So I'm sure you'll be sending the book to book to Norhan. Um, if I use this pyramid in learning, which layer shall I start thinking about adding the educational content? Very good question. Thank you for this great question. Um, I would say from the get-go, I would say you have to think about your educational content from the first moment that you start building your game. So your theme, you know, your setting can relate to what you're teaching people. If you have, you know, to make a game around, I don't know, ancient Egypt or something, uh, it can be placed in ancient Egypt, for example. You know, so your theme is ancient Egypt. I actually have played a card game, a great card game, where the aim was to teach kids about ancient Egypt and all the cards had to do with mummies and all of that. Um, so I would say from the get-go, from the first moment, it has to link to what you're trying to do. Okay, good. Uh, Keith, one of the previous speakers was asking, um, he loves storytelling, but most of his clients reject it. So 
uh, and they kind of end up with a quite vanilla concept there. So, I mean, just a, what he calls a community context. Um, do you have, do you, have you got sort of uh, stats or anything? What, what would you do to persuade that the storytelling approach might be more interesting and more engaging? That is a very good question. And I want to say at the beginning of my talk that I have absolutely no stats for what I'm presenting. <laughs> it's just my own idea. Um, I don't have specific stats around gamified applications that are more engaging when you have a story. Um, you might be able to show them an example. If you can build two, two products, one with a bit of a story and one without any story, you might be able to persuade them. Uh, but other than that, I think it's quite difficult with a lot of people in business environments to persuade them. Again, you have to really strike that balance. How much story do I need? Um, and I think when you show them a prototype, and you have that balance right, I think they will get it. Yeah. You know, so I would definitely suggest you to have a small prototype and yeah. show them that. It's, 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 it's interesting, isn't it? I mean, it's, so if we take fitness, for example, I mean, I think, I think you probably find there's a, there's, a, there's, a, there's, a, there's a spectrum, isn't there, of different ones. So, I mean, on, on the, if you take fitness, you've on the, on the sort of one side of it, you've got a very kind of raw running environment, like Map My Run or Strava. In the middle, you have something that's in between the two, sort of a couch to 5K or, you know, park run is also a bit of a themed thing. And then right at the far end, you've got something like Run Zombies Run, which yeah. is obviously very storytelling. So is, I mean, do you think that that's, that's the case, that, there's a, that, 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 that Keith should be saying to clients, look, there's a spectrum and trying to sort of push them along the spectrum? I, yeah, exactly. I think if you saw them the spectrum of possibilities, for example, that's, that's a great example, Toby. Thank you for that. Health is a great example of how you can show them three different applications with different levels of storytelling, and they get a sense of what they can expect from this. But again, what I keep telling people, and I have that as part of my book as well, prototyping, I think, show them a paper prototype of something, you know, or a very simple dummy prototype on a phone, and tell them, right, okay, I know you are averse to storytelling, but this is my suggestion. You want to play it for five minutes and like give me your feedback. So I think definitely show them some examples of you know successful applications. Like Run Zombies Run is a very successful one and a good example at that. But also show them a prototype. You know, show them some sketches, some simple things. So, you know, you can do things on PowerPoint even. You know, the the product I mentioned that uh, we prototype with my colleague at the moment, we do that pen and paper simply. He has written all the story on PowerPoints and he prints the PowerPoints out and he gives me the PowerPoints and I sort of like play. So, fantastic. you know. Yeah, fantastic advice. Well, thank you very much. For thank silly. you. Goddess, okay, I'm pronouncing your name. And, uh, <laughs> well done. Look forward to the book. So uh, make sure you, um, uh, so we'll send that out and also put, put in the chat uh, link so others can find yes. out about it, please.